All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Jim Peer Podcast. And once again, I have to apologize for the lack of content on this channel. It's been... It's been a little crazy. Work has been fucking exhausting. And home hasn't been much better. Not to mention the audiobook thing. Which is coming along. I'm in the editing stage now. And uh, I got the weekend off. So I got all Saturday and Sunday to get it edited. Which means I'm going to have to wake up at like 8am. But hopefully I can get that whole thing edited this weekend. And then be back to producing regular content. On the bright side, the... Uh, the Andrew Beery guy, the author of the Catherine Kimbridge series, he uploaded the next book to ACX and I jumped on that shit. He gave me first, uh, first try at it and I sent off an audition and he approved. So I'm going to be doing seven and eight in the series. So that's, that's sweet. Um, I think part, a serious part of the problem with being able to put out content because I really don't want to go a month without putting out anything but the podcast. Uh, but this job is getting in the way officially at this point. Um, it's just getting in the way. I'm not getting paid enough for what I'm doing. And the level of disrespect at the job is phenomenal. You know, I, I have more self-respect than this. And I'm sorry, guys, this is going to be an angry cast. I got several things I'm I'm fucking mad about. Uh, one of them is probably going to take up the majority of the podcast just because I could go off on that for probably hours. But I think I'm going to quit this job, guys. Well, no, there's no thinking. I am. I like within the next few weeks here, I'm going to quit this fucking job. I'm going to go look for a nice uh, perimeter third shift security job where I can sit. And I, I can, like, save up my money and get a, a shitty little laptop that's that'll run Reaper. That's all I need it to do is run Reaper. And maybe play, like, a couple of old shit PC games. And uh, I, can, I can go on my patrols and do my security duties and then sit there and edit audiobooks and podcasts. And, you know, creepypasta stuff or whatever. Because this whole, like, not even 40-hour a week job, like, that's another thing that pissed me off. They're fucking cutting my hours. So not only am I making a joke of an hourly wage uh, for what I'm doing, I'm getting my hours cut. And I'm getting more duties tacked onto that. So it's just not worth it. You know, I, I have more, like I said, I have more self-respect than this. So I'm just, I'm, I'm about fucking done with this. It's everything that I can do to not call up my boss and say, you know what? Here's my two weeks notice. I'm done. I'm just done. This isn't worth it. I don't need this job. And that's, see, that's something that people don't really understand is that there's a power play when you don't need the job. You know what I mean? Like there's other jobs out there. I can go get other jobs. All I have to do, all, all I have to do is be willing to work in shitty conditions like third shift. No one wants to work third shift. It's like fucking 11 at night until seven in the morning. But I can work third shift because, A, I'm a night owl anyway, and B, I, I do not care. I don't have a fucking life. What am I going to do? Go out into the nightlife? I don't have... I, I, none of my friends live near here. I'm not going out to bars and shit. Yeah, I'll, I'll work at night. I don't care. So I think, I think there's going to be some employment changes coming up in my life pretty soon. But um, one thing that I wanted to see about, and I figured I might as well talk about it on the podcast, is the whole Brexit thing. Because that vote was today, so I'm going to look up and see how that went, if they've already tallied it up. Brexit vote results. Brexit, UK votes in the EU referendum. The Leave camp had a slight lead, apparently, according to the Wall Street Journal one fucking minute ago. Uh, this is... This is on the 23rd, so Thursday, the, the day of the thing. So voting is closed, and the first area's reported results. The Leave camp has a slight lead over Remain following a big victory in Sunderland. That caused the pound to fall sharply against the dollar. Really? It did? Really? Like, leaving the EU got them to... got the pound lowered a little bit? Seriously? 
I, I think there might be some some fuckery going on with that. That doesn't sound right to me. But apparently, uh, leave is at fifty three percent at this point. It doesn't look honestly from this from this graph that they have here. Wait, let me see if I can. No, uh, it's just it's taking me to a fucking Twitter thing. Okay, uh, the state of play so far. How many dollars one pound buys? 1.5, 1. it's down to like 1.4 right now. So one pound will buy $1.5. And it'll buy 1.2 euros. Eh, big deal. That's not that's not too bad. It's still stronger than the dollar. I really am for the leave camp, though. I mean, I know it's not really any of my business because I don't live in England. But I do, I do support the whole Brexit thing. I, I think that the UK needs to get out of the EU. The EU is just a shithole. It's... Like, from what I've heard from people who live there and have done research into the EU, people like Teal Deer, and uh, I think I watched a video by Stefan Molyneux on it and a couple of other people. Yeah, the EU is just fucked. It's just a horrible, horrible piece of shit. And the UK would probably do better in the long run leaving. That it, That's just from what from what I can tell from the uh, information that's been presented to me so far. And it looks like the UK is leaving the EU. <laughs> it looks like, uh, like Dr. Randomer Cam said, they're they're voting on whether or not they should have the right to vote, <laughs> which is all kinds of funny to me. But uh, yeah, good good on the UK if they fucking leave. I hope they get the fuck out of that. Okay, ne- next thing that I wanted to talk about, I just kind of like I don't really know enough about. EU politics in the UK to get in depth on it, just from what I've from what I've been able to determine with the limited information available to me, um, and the limited time I have to to study it, it really seems like the best idea is for the UK to get the fuck out, <laughs> leave, run, and never look back. Also, just to let you guys know, I haven't had a drink in a while, and I'm still really salty about this, so I'm gonna tie on a mean drunk while I talk about this, okay? Also, it's like 8.15 and I haven't had anything to eat since like 3 o'clock, something like that. So yeah, strap in, guys. Shit's about to get intense. Um, So, you know, I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks lately, partly because my phone died on me and I don't have the podcast to listen to. Like, There's a problem with it. I got to take it up to the Verizon store on Saturday. But uh, I've been bringing my Kindle with me to work because it has the the Audible app thing on it. And I just keep it in like, like I got this gas mask bag from like four or five years ago when me and my brother bought a couple of, uh, I think they're Russian issue gas masks. Really, really effective gas masks. It was on BUDK.com. They might still have them up there. Uh, I, I think they have the uh, Israeli issue one too. Really, really good gas masks. I would recommend just having one around the house. Like you don't even need it in case of chemical attack. Like if you have animals and you need to clean up shit, you won't smell a fucking thing. Or if you've got like some particularly rank garbage that you have to take out, just strap on your gas mask, take care of that shit. You can even wash out your garbage can. You won't smell a goddamn thing. I highly recommend the gas mask. The gas mask is very nice. But I have this bag that the gas mask comes in, and it had like a couple of extra filters and shit in there too. Um, But I just like slip the Kindle in there with my cigarettes and my medication and shit, and I just carry it to work, strap it on my hip, and I listen to audiobooks while I work. Well... (laughs) I've been listening to uh, some Philip K. Dick audiobooks. Well, I started listening to some Philip K. Dick audiobooks. Uh, And if you guys don't know who Philip K. Dick is, uh, then you are doing yourself a severe disservice, okay? Philip K. Dick is one of the best writers in science fiction. And anybody who's uh, been paying attention to my Tumblr for the past week knows exactly where this is fucking going. And yes, I am about to ream the shit out of Ridley Scott's ass. So... Philip K. Dick is right up there with people like Robert Heinlein and H.G. Wells, and I'm I'm trying to think of another one, Isaac Asimov, people like that. He's one of the classics. Harlan Ellison, he's required reading. 
Uh, you've probably seen movies that his books are, or that are based off of his his books and short stories. And yeah, his short stories were even turned into movies. Let me just let me just run down a list right quick. Uh, Philip K. Dick movies. There we go. Thank you, Google. You're a damn good search engine. Okay, uh, let's go down. Let's go down these uh, these movies right here, and let's see if you've seen any of them. And if you have, you know, then you've seen a movie based off of a Philip K. Dick story. Um, Blade Runner is a big one. The Harrison Ford movie from the '80s. Uh, and I have a grudge against that movie because of Ridley Scott. Uh, Total Recall. I also have a grudge against that movie. Um, the original Total Recall and the new one, they're both loosely based on Philip K. Dick's story, uh, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. Blade Runner is based on Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Uh, Minority Report. The Adjustment Bureau. Screamers. Imposter. Imposter is a really, really fucking good movie. Like, I think that was Gary Sinise, but uh, that that starred starred in the movie. He was the main character. But they kept like they damn near used the short story Imposter as the script for the movie. It was insane. It was so well done. Um, it's one of the best. Imposter is one of the best uh, uh literature to film adaptations of a movie ever. Uh, Radio Free Albemuth, which is a book that I just I actually just picked that one up. I'm going to I'm going to listen to the audiobook on that one cuz I've been wanting to read that for for a long fucking time. Uh A Scanner Darkly, which if you've never seen A Scanner Darkly, then god, um oh god. Yeah, you really need to see A Scanner Darkly. That's one of Richard Linklater's best works. Right up there with um what was the name of that? Uh uh Waking Life. Also, look up Waking Life. It's not based on a Philip K. Dick story, but uh, it's... God, it's really good. Um, Paycheck, Next, Screamers, The Hunting. I guess that's a sequel. Blade Runner 2? Oh, God. Uh, Morning Patrol, Natural City, King of the Elves, and Megaville are the ones that they have up on just Google. Um... So yeah, you've probably seen a movie based on a Philip K. Dick story at one point, and whether or not it was any good depends on a lot of factors. It might be a good movie. For example, Blade Runner is a very good movie. Very good movie, if you completely ignore the source material, which unfortunately is what Ridley Scott seems to do. Actually, I think that Philip K. Dick was involved in the... It's like like, okay, here's how big of a, uh, this is going to seem like a diversion, but here's how, or a divergence, but here's how big of a Douglas Adams fan I am. I can watch the Hitchhiker's Guide movie that came out in the mid-2000s and pinpoint the exact second in production of that movie where Douglas Adams died. Just the exact moment. So, oh, okay, now we're completely off the fucking rails. Like, we're following the book, we're following the book, we're using conversations from the book in the script. You know, this is just perfect, it's perfect, it's gravy, it's gravy, left turn! Yeah, apparently nobody uh, nobody talked to Philip K. Dick. This is according to Wikipedia, which is where I go for all of my information. Because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm so fucking reliable. The studio sent Philip the David Peoples rewrite... Although Dick died shortly before the film's release, he was pleased with the rewritten script and with a 20-minute special effects test reel that was screened for him. Uh, despite his well-known skepticism of Hollywood in principle, Dick enthused to Ridley Scott that the world created for the film looked exactly as he imagined it. Um, now, he did. there were a lot of liberties taken with Blade Runner. A lot of liberties were taken with Blade Runner. Uh, but the thing, the thing, the difference between Blade Runner and what I want to talk about here is that Blade Runner kept the core of the story. Like, for example, A Scanner Darkly. I've read A Scanner Darkly at least twice, and I've watched the movie probably six times. It's fucking amazing. Honestly, you can watch that movie and never read the book and get the exact same story. There's a couple of things like like uh, Charles Freck in the movie is a combination of two different characters in the novel. They just kind of mush these characters together because they were both minor orbiters around the main characters of like Bob Arctor and Donna and Barris and uh, 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 Luckman. And 
they, they, he just kind of, uh, Linklater just kind of meshed these two characters together and, you know, kind of spun it in his own direction. And he took out a couple of really, really tiny things that would not affect the story at all. And he kept the core of the story and it was all there and it's, it's fucking beautiful. It's one of the best, uh, film adaptations of a novel I've ever seen in my life. Like it blows Lord of the Rings out of the fucking water, even the extended versions. So I was, I was listening to some audiobooks at work and I was like, well, I have the man in the high castle. So I'm, I haven't listened, uh, you know, I haven't read a Philip K. Dick book in forever. Philip K. Dick, like I said, my, my favorite science fiction writer, just absolute God tier favorite. Um, so I'm, I, I've read man in the high castle once. I might as well, you know, listen to the audiobook since I fucking bought it and I'm sitting there listening to it. And I had like, I think you would call it Satori. Let me look up the exact definition of Satori. Sudden enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, it's apparently a Buddhist concept. But uh, it's a Japanese word. But it means sudden enlightenment. And I'm sitting there listening to this book. And I'm not going to lie. The Man in the High Castle has one, for the vast majority of that book, it has one of the most mundane plots out there. Just so far as, like, the sequence of events and the characters' lives and everything. Like, there's two characters in that book that are spies. And they're not really focused on for the vast majority of the book. Um, well, they kind of are. They're main characters, but, like, their their whole spying thing is pretty well hidden until the reveal. Um, and no, I'm not going to tell you who they are. But uh, the basic plot of The Man in the High Castle is this is an alternate present story uh, where, the, where the Axis powers won World War II. And they basically kind of split America down the middle, right? Um, you know, Germany, the Nazi Reich gets the eastern half of the country and then Japan gets the western half and they mostly concentrate it's like the the it's like the imperial pacific states or something like that and the the greater reich or something um greater reich territories but uh that's that's like the world and it deals with a guy called Robert Childen who runs a store that deals in American artifacts, uh, like historicity. Like he regularly makes like $15,000 for a sale because this is like a gun that was used in Gettysburg or a world war two, um, not a world war two, uh, a civil war, um, recruitment poster shit like that. He, that's what he deals in. And then there are a couple of guys, uh, Ed and Frank who run, like they they work for a a company that makes counterfeit weapons. They make counterfeit Colt 44s. And they they try to undermine Robert Childen to get him to sell their merchandise because they're going to go into the jewelry business and make contemporary American art. And then there's another subplot with the man in the high castle who is uh this guy, I can't remember his name. But he wrote a novel called The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, which is the novel within a novel for The Man in the High Castle. And it depicts a world where the Allies won. Not our world, but another world where the Allies won. And, like, the basically what I got out of the novel at the very end, <clears throat> my, my, little, my little Satori moment, happened at the very end of the book. When she's the main, one of the main characters, Juliana finally gets to meet the writer of The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. And basically the point is, even though the Japanese and the Germans won World War II, they still lost. That was my, that was my Satori moment. The winners are the losers. It doesn't matter how, you know, how well they did in the war, because there's also a subplot where the Germans are going to bomb the home islands, they're going to bomb Japan and wipe the Japanese off the face of the earth um, and possibly wipe the rest of humanity off the earth given enough time. 
so that's that's kind of that was kind of my little come to Jesus moment, my little my little Satori moment about uh, the man in the high castle. But it's a really really good novel. It's very well done. It's kind of cerebral, and there's a lot of little moments uh, that really kind of encapsulate the whole thing. And I just I can't sing the book's praises enough. So it's it's one of my favorite Philip K. Dick novels. And there's a very, very damn good reason why it won, I want to say, a Nebula Award and another award, that uh, a Hugo Award and a Nebula Award, I think. It, it, there's very good reasons why it won those awards back, back in the day. But I was flipping through my Kindle the other day, and, you know, Amazon now does TV shows. So they were advertising the Man in the High Castle TV show adapted by Ridley Scott and, you know, a couple other people. And I was like, oh shit, you know, I have the, I have the audio book. I should, I should go listen to it and then check out the, the show to see how, how well they did, you know, see what, see what they did with it. So I went and listened to the novel. I had that Satori moment and I was just like, oh my God, this is one of the best pieces of fiction ever put to paper. This is God tier right here. Why, why aren't we teaching this in high school English? And then I started watching the show. It took them all of five minutes to fuck it up. Five minutes. Five fucking minutes. Right? Five minutes. And I know it seems like I'm repeating that, but I really want to stress... That's the exact amount of screen time, including the opening credits and theme song, that it took them to fuck it up. All of five minutes, and everything's gone to hell already. Basically, what they did was they kept the subplot about the German spy from Sweden trying to inform the Japanese people about Operation Dandelion, which is the um, the German plot to blow up the home islands. They kept that. They kept the basic idea of the world and like certain geographical boundaries. They put in a, uh, a uh, neutral zone in the middle of America for some fucking reason. I don't think that was in the novel. I don't remember that being in the novel, but uh, they put that in there and like they turned Juliana into a spy they turned the Grasshopper Lies Heavy into newsreels from an alternate universe about when, you know, the Allies won World War II. Like I say, not necessarily our world, but a world where the Allies won World War II. And the man in the high castle is this mysterious shadowy figure that is collecting these newsreels for some reason. And, like, Frank Fink gets wrapped up in the resistance against the Germans because his wife and kids got killed for being Jewish. And it's just like what I'm, what I'm relating right now. I took from the Wikipedia thing. Cause I watched eight minutes of that fucking thing and it got into the first gunfight. And I was like, all right, this isn't the man in the high castle. I know this isn't the man in the high castle. I asked for, this isn't what I wanted fucking out. I'm too angry to sit here and watch this right now because you've taken one of the best stories ever written and fucked it up so badly because you just couldn't, you couldn't sit there and just adapt the story. This is why the guy who made Dazed and Confused is a better adapter of novels, especially Philip K. Dick novels, than the guy who made Alien and Blade Runner. Because when Richard Linklater made A Scanner Darkly, he kept as true to that book as fucking possible. There are conversations that are word for word lifted from the book and put in that movie. He used the book as a script and he just reworked a couple of minor things to make it fit into an hour and a half or two hours or however fucking long that movie is. What Ridley Scott can't seem to do is that he has to put his own fucking spin on it. And I'm sitting here like, I wanted the man in the high castle. You could very easily stretch that and, like I say, change things, fine. You want to turn it into a TV show, I understand that things are going to have to be changed. But you kept a third, uh, like, barely a third of the book, barely a third of the book, and just scrapped everything else and rewrote it. 
to suit your own little plot so you could make it more action-y for modern audiences or whatever the fuck his reason was, you fucked up. You fucked up the story. Okay? That's what you fucking did. You screwed up. And now, The Man in the High Castle show, by itself, on its own, might actually be very good. I'm probably not giving it a fair shake, because I'm incredibly biased, as you can hear. But I cannot stand it when people fuck up Philip K. Dick novels. Like, that's the one guy... Like, I enjoy Starship Troopers. I still lament the fact that they diverged so far from the book that it's almost completely unrecognizable. Almost. Like, there's hardly any of the philosophy that Robert Heinlein put into that book. And if you've never read Starship Troopers, go read Starship Troopers. You're doing yourself an extreme disservice if you don't read Starship Troopers at least once. At least one time. But that's what, that's what fucking happened with The Man in the High Castle. You turned it into the, star, uh, the, the Starship Troopers adaptation of the Starship Troopers novel. That's what you fucking did. You fucked up. This is Blade Runner all over again, only worse. At least Blade Runner kept the core message of the book, which was a lot more, I guess, cerebral and and well thought out than, you know, how they made it seem in in the movie. Like, yeah, it looks like what Philip K. Dick imagined his world to look like. But did you really get the point of that novel? Did you really understand the point of that novel, and did you really bring that across in film? And I think that, to an extent, he did. To an extent, Blade Runner keeps the spirit of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. A Scanner Darkly is almost a direct fucking port of the novel into film. It also has an all-star cast. Uh, uh, Keanu Reeves plays Bob Arthur. And that's one of those movies where you watch Keanu Reeves and you're like, holy fuck, that dude can actually act. Because Keanu gets typecast a lot and he did like the Matrix thing and he gets he gets shat on for his acting ability or, or perceived lack thereof. But when you watch a movie like like A Scanner Darkly or what was the other one? Uh, I want to say it was Dracula 2000. It was it was Wes Craven, I believe. Um, Keanu Reeves played Jonathan Harker in one of the Dracula movies, and he did an amazing job. Keanu Reeves can really fucking act, but he needs a good director and a good story to let him act. You know, he, he did a good job in The Matrix, but, you know, after The Matrix, everybody kind of perceives him as that guy. I think he could, I think he did a good job with Constantine. You know, I recently started reading the comics, and yeah, he he did a pretty good job with it. You know, he's not British and he's not blonde, but he he did okay. Um, I, I'd have to go and rewatch the movie. Constantine seemed like one of those popcorn movies to me. Like, it wasn't really meant to be much of anything. Um, I don't know. I'm going to have to rewatch it. But the fucking up of The Man in the High Castle has just, like, I'm so mad at Ridley Scott for taking a book with that much meaning and that much thought put into it. And the thing is, the thing is, what upsets me about fucking up Philip K. Dick's stories is that few of them, there are precious few Philip K. Dick stories that would translate into film properly. Precious few. There are also precious few that make sense all the way through. Like, for example, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep and The Man in the High Castle have a cohesive narrative and a point that they're trying to make all the way through the book, and he stays to that, and it's really fucking well done. Then you get a book like Lies Incorporated, which had another title. Hang on. The Unteleported Man was the original name of that novel. And it, it's been it, it's been republished as Lies Incorporated. But uh yeah, halfway through, that book just stops making sense. It just stops making fucking sense. Um like the way it goes is like this guy his life is kind of going to shit. If I remember right, it's been a few years, so bear with me. But his life is kind of going to shit. 
and people are being like teleported one way to I want to say the place was called Whale's Mouth. And it was a colony on another planet for humans. And it was supposed to be just like the fucking dream. It was great. You go there. Life is beautiful. There's abundant crops. There's, you know, scantily clad, big breasted women just running through fields all day. You know, like you'd see on a Stormfront website. (laughs) And it's just supposed to be like the best thing fucking ever. And the guy can't figure out whether or not it's bullshit, right? So he's like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to go. So he he teleports in and then somebody hits him with this psychotropic drug and he goes on a drug trip. And from that point on, like when the needle enters that guy's arm, the book stops pretending to make any kind of semblance of sense. It, It just goes off into fucking crazy town. Which is kind of kind of the special thing about Philip K. Dick's writing is that he, dude was a drug addict, like a serious drug addict. He was also probably a paranoid schizophrenic. He also had a lot of weird experiences in his life that kind of led him to be very paranoid. And that kind of shows in his writing, uh, like The Cosmic Puppets, which was one of his first novels, I believe. Uh, it, it just kind of... Like, that's kind of Philip K. Dick's cosmology right there. We, like, people people don't matter. <laughs> and there's malevolent and maybe good forces out there, but the good forces could probably give a fuck about us. So when he makes a real good, coherent story and narrative with a point and, like, subtext and all of the things that go into a great story... And then someone like Ridley Scott takes it and just is like, all right, well, I'm just going to like cut this thing's arm off and stick my 12 foot inflatable neon light up dick in its ass and just rape it to death because I can make money off of it. And who cares if it if it follows the original vision of, you know, the guy who actually wrote the fucking story, who's a better sci fi author than I'll ever fucking be. You know, who cares? Well, I care. I care very fucking deeply, and it viscerally upsets me that the man in the High Castle was turned into an action spy TV series when it should have been more quiet and subdued, and, like, the focus shouldn't have been on the whole spy thing and gunfights and flashy special effects and shit. Like, it didn't need that. It really didn't need any of that. Bet here comes Ridley Scott, who's going to save us all from Philip K. Dick's boring writing. It pisses me off so fucking badly. I had such high hopes for the fucking Man in the High Castle thing. I had such high hopes for that TV show. I, I was like, oh my God, this is one of Philip K. Dick's best novels. This is right up there with Scanner Darkly and Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep and... Books like that. It, it, this is this is the best. This is God tier Philip K. Dick, and they're making it into a TV show. Oh my God, I could cream my jeans right now. And alas, I was fucking blue balled. I was blue balled, and I'm pissed. I'm really pissed about it. So, on a related tangent, who wants to road trip with me to kick Ridley Scott's ass? I'm being serious. (laughs) Which of you is willing to saddle up with me and go find Ridley Scott and put a boot in his ass? It's just like you can't resist inserting yourself into it, can you? Like, you can't just take yourself out of the fucking picture. Like, the Lord of the Rings movies, which they get a lot of shit for being long-winded, And fair enough, okay? Fair enough. The extended versions of those movies are three hours long each. Fine, yeah, they're a little long-winded. They're also a really, really, really good film adaptation of the book. I would rather watch the movies because the movies are more entertaining than Tolkien's prose. Tolkien's prose is insanely hard to get through. I've read the Lord of the Rings series twice. I would not wish that on my worst enemy. 
I read them when I was very young. And that's about when you should be reading The Lord of the Rings, when you're about eighth grade. You know, when you're when you're about about hitting puberty, you should read The Lord of the Rings once and then maybe another time in high school if you feel like it. If you really want to if you're really masochistic, you know, then you should move on to people who can actually write like Robin Hobb or Robert Heinlein or, you know, Isaac Asimov or, you know, people like that. Harlan Ellison. But the Lord of the Rings film adaptations are good because Peter Jackson took himself out of it. Like, Peter Jackson had a fucking reputation before the Lord of the Rings movies came along. You know what I mean? He, he, that fucker made The Frighteners. If you've never seen The Frighteners, go watch The Frighteners and tell me that ain't one of the best movies you've ever seen in your goddamn life. It's awesome. It's a great supernatural thriller. So Peter Jackson had every right to come into this with big dick, I'm Peter Jackson, fuck all of you people, but he didn't. He didn't. And that's the important distinction here, is that Ridley Scott cannot seem to resist going, well, I'm Ridley Scott, I know what's best, so I'm just going to fuck up the story here. Not because, like, this shit doesn't fit in with, like, we couldn't turn this into a movie or a TV show, but because I think that my way is better. Well, it's not fucking better, okay? Your way is not better, Ridley Scott, and whoever the fuck else helped you with this fucking abomination that you've made over there. And I'm going to give it, like, like a week or two, and I'm going to try and go back to it and actually sit down and give it a fair shake and, and watch it. But I'm so fucking upset about what I saw and what I read on the wiki where, you know, like I say, there, there, well, now I have to update my list. There's, I used to say there's two types of people that write shit on Wikipedia. There's trolls and then there's people who actually care so much about this that they know everything and, you know, they're, they're kind of an authority on the subject. Now there is, there's those two people and then people who are doing it for a political agenda which unfortunately there's a lot of them but so far as like film and and stuff like that you're pretty okay you're pretty okay so long as you're so long as you're looking at like media like novels and comics and films and stuff like that uh, you're probably not going to run into any serious misinformation and remember kids wikipedia is not a source but wikipedia lists its sources and those are valid. <laughs> so remember that the next time you're doing a college term paper. Go to Wikipedia, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, find the information that you want, find which citation it is, and then go to that citation and cite that instead of Wikipedia. It'll make you seem more legit. Um, and chances are the professor doesn't have the time to actually go and, and check the Wikipedia article and make sure that you're not pulling this straight from Wikipedia. Especially if you don't cite Wikipedia which you should never cite Wikipedia. Anyway. God, I'm... I'm not drunk enough. <sighs> but yeah, like like I said, the Lord of the Rings adaptations are good because Peter Jackson looked at the Lord of the Rings, which is an immense series of books. Like, you're not going to get any argument from me on that. They're huge. So he had to cut something. The most commonly cited uh, example of what got cut from the movies is uh, Tom Bombadil. Yeah, I was upset too, guys. But let's be honest, Tom Bombadil was a side quest. And you could you could do without that in the movies, especially if you're trying to cut it down to like 2 hours m maximum, 2 hours to get people to sit in the movie theater for it. Yeah, you you kind of got to cut some shit. But he stayed really true to the books. Like all of the main plot points are there. You know, the character development is along the same lines. It's it's a really, really good adaptation. Whatever else you want to say about the Lord of the Rings movies, they're a really good adaptation of the books. And I can say this with full authority because I'm a fucking nerd. And I've read those books and I've watched those movies a bunch of times. And yes, where the Lord of the Rings series is concerned so far as the novels go, two times reading those books through is a bunch of times. Because God knows Tolkien didn't make it easy. But Ridley Scott cannot seem to grasp that fucking concept. He has to try to make it better. 
And I don't understand that mentality. Like, if you're going to take someone's someone's vision, someone's vision of the story that they have told, and adapt it into another medium, why change it in severe, seriously plot-altering ways? Why change it? That doesn't make any fucking sense to me. Like, do you think that you can do better than the guy who originally fucking told the story? Like, I'm not, I, I came to this, I wasn't looking for fan fiction, all right? I wasn't looking for your interpretation of the man in the high castle. I was looking for the fucking man in the high castle. I wanted to see uh, Robert Childen's consignment shop or, or American, God damn it, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to look this up. But yeah, I wanted to see Nabusuke Tagomi walk into Childen's antique shop in San Francisco, California, you know, I wanted to see Ed and Frank try to get their jewelry business off the ground. I wanted to see Joe and Juliana trying to get to see, what was his name? Hang on, I can, okay, apparently, apparently there was, uh, the Mountain States, which was a neutral buffer zone in America. Apparently that did actually happen in the, in the novel. Abinson. That's the guy's name. That's the guy who wrote The Grasshopper Lies Heavy in The Man in the High Castle. You know, I wanted to see Juliana and Joe making their way to Abinson's quote-unquote castle, the high castle, you know, and I wanted to see that subplot with with Juliana figuring out that Joe is, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you what Joe is. But uh, it, it's really good. Like, go read the book. Go read the book. Go listen to the audiobook. The audiobook is is a really good adaptation. I really like the way the guy did it. His his performance was spot on. My only my only real problem with it was the guy doesn't know how to speak Japanese, or or doesn't even have like a passing affiliation with Japanese. So whenever uh, whenever Nobusuke Tagomi comes up, he calls him Nobusuke Tagomi. And it's just like, mm, oh God, my my wannabe polyglot weeps. But other than that, it's perfect. It's spot on. It's great. Yeah, the book the book is probably better than the TV series. Although, like, I'm not going to sit here and deny that Rid- Ridley Scott is one of the geniuses of our time with with science fiction movies and shit like this, essentially. Like he's he's a great filmmaker. He's he's right up there with uh with who's the fucker who did um God damn it I'm gonna have to look this up because I the name is right on the tip of my fucking tongue Stanley Kubrick he's right up there with Stanley Kubrick he's a genius he's he's a really good filmmaker you know I've watched a lot of Ridley Scott's movies I respect the hell out of Ridley Scott for his filmmaking but. But when you fuck with my favorite science fiction writer, you've crossed a line, dude, especially with one of his best stories. I don't know. I'm just I'm really fucking angry about that. And I'm probably going to remain angry about that for a long fucking time at this point. Uh, God. OK, I've, I've rambled on about that enough. I've probably said all I've got to say. I feel I feel a little bit I feel like I've had the catharsis. I'm still really fucking angry, but I feel like I've had a little bit of catharsis about that. So uh, I thought I, I would um, tell you guys just to because we're at like 50 minutes here and it's probably closer to 45 for you guys. But um, I thought I would tell you guys about some good music that I recently heard. Uh, I was going to work one day. Like a couple of weeks ago and. I didn't want to listen to an audiobook. I just, I don't know why. I just didn't. Um so I started flipping through radio stations. And I was just flipping through, flipping through, flipping through. And I came across this one this one station that plays like jazz and funk and really good like blues rock and oh god, like they had the fucking Tedeschi Trucks band playing. On this radio station, guys. Like, the Tedeschi Trucks Band is fucking phenomenal, and they never get radio play. I've never heard them on the radio. But, 
Uh, the Tedeschi Trucks Band is uh, Derek Trucks and his wife, Susan Tedeschi. It's uh, it's their band. I think they have members of the Allman Brothers. Uh, Derek Trucks is actually in the Allman Brothers. Uh, he's the drummer of the Allman Brothers, one of the drummers. They have two of them. They have J-Mo and Butch Trucks. Derek Trucks is Butch Trucks' nephew, and he is one of the best blues guitarists to ever live. He, like, picked right up where Dwayne Allman left off when he died. Um... So, like, that guy's own band with his wife, who is also an amazing guitarist and a great singer. She's just, oh, God, she's got this, like, Janis Joplin quality to her voice. And it's just, it's fucking nectar. Go look up the album Revelator by the Tedeschi Trucks Band. It's a T-E-D-E-S-C-H-I dash Trucks Band. Um... They're, oh God, they're so good. But uh, I, I heard this song on, on the, the radio station and it took me like a week and a half to actually listen to the station enough to where they played the song and then they said who it was by. And it's uh, Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors. That's uh, Drew H-O-L-C-O-M-B and the Neighbors. And the song is called Here We Go. And it is just so easy and beautiful. And the video is silly as shit because they dress up in a bunch of different like Halloween costumes. And I don't know if they went to a con or what, but they got a bunch of different cosplayers. Like I saw like Princess Leia and a giant lobster and their keyboard, their keyboardist dresses up as a giraffe. And uh, the ma- the lead singer Drew Holcomb is dressed up as a in a banana suit, and they're all dancing to the music and shit. It's it's fucking brilliant. I'll put the link in the description, um, if I can if I can fucking remember to do that shit. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a great song. You guys would absolutely fucking love it. It's one of the best songs I've heard on the radio in a long fucking time, and it's contemporary. That was released. I want to say this year. Um, let me, let me just hit up Google right quick. I I have to look a lot of shit up in this podcast. Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors. Let's check the Wikipedia, because that's where I go for everything else. Um, holy shit. Their songs have received 40 TV placements. Holy shit. Appearing on How I Met Your Mother... Criminal Minds, Parenthood, Nashville, House, Justified, and more. Damn. I think the album was on Medicine. I think the album that the song was on was Medicine. Um, let me see if I can... Yeah, Medicine is the name of the album. Apparently this came out last year. So, but yeah, it's still it's still a really fucking good song. I want to pick up the rest of the album. These guys are just that fucking good. Um... But yeah, from what from what I can hear from Here We Go, which is the only song that I've really listened, uh, song by them that I've listened to, um, it, it's really good blues, well, blues rock, basically, uh, kind of, kind of mellow shit like that, but I'm gonna have to listen to the rest of the album and report back, but, uh, from Here We Go, this band is awesome, this band is really fucking good, go check out Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors. Another another good, really good piece of music um, is Jonathan Young. And this guy has a YouTube channel. And one of the things that really, really surprises me about this guy is that he does Disney metal covers. And it's metal. It's like, like he did I Just Can't Wait to Be King, which I'm probably going to listen to that again. Uh, after, after this, but like that, no, that's not pop punk. That's metal. There's way too much guitar fuckery going on in that song for it to be pop punk. It's really, really good. And this guy has such a range with his voice. Like the only person I can think of who's comparable to this guy is King Diamond. And if you don't know who King Diamond is, go look up Merciful Fate. And King Diamond also did, he's still got his solo thing, King Diamond, going on. But King Diamond is one of those people who's a legend in the metal scene because of his range of vocals. 
he he can go from really growly shit to like shattering crystal with his voice on a dime and this guy this jonathan young cat does the exact same fucking thing he's got immense range he's one of the most talented singers i've heard on youtube or in music in general honestly just to be perfectly fucking honest he's really really fucking good and he also plays several instruments i I know he plays guitar and drums but god god guys go go look up his cover of i just can't wait to be king um he did a cover of uh what what's the name of that fucking song let me see if i can find it it's it's the song from it's the song from mulan i'll make a man out of you that was it uh yeah i'll make a man out, his cover of i'll make a man out of you was really fucking good um yeah just look this jonathan young cat up i'll put a link to his youtube channel in the description along with a couple of songs that i really like by him like uh he's he's also got albums up on like amazon music uh I, I i imagine he's up on itunes i haven't checked um but yeah it's just if you want some really 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 fucking good music uh he he does a lot of covers like most of his songs are covers uh but it, it's just like mind-blowingly good covers um i, I would really like to hear an original album by this guy. He also did the, uh, the one punch man theme song, the hero, uh, full, full version. Look for the full version. I'll, I'll put that in the description. Cause that was what got me into this guy. I was looking for the one punch man theme song and I saw his version up there and I started listening to it and I can't stop listening to it. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. You guys just absolutely have to check out this Jonathan young cat. He's just God damn. But all right, I've I've rambled on long enough, guys. We're already I'm already at an hour here. Y'all probably already at like 50 minutes, 55 minutes, something like that. Um, but yeah, thank you guys very much for listening. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I hope y'all are having a good week. Uh, I hope y'all are having a better week than me. I hope y'all are less angry than me. Um, and if anybody out there has the sack to do it, go out and watch uh, the Man in the High Castle and and let me know how it is. Report report back in the comments and let me know how it is. Uh, if, if it's actually good on its own, cause honestly, I'm just so fucking upset about the direction that they took with it that I don't even know if I can sit down and give it a fair shake unless somebody watches it first and is like, no, no, they did a good job. You should go and you should go and check it out. So, you know, if anybody out there has the time to actually sit down and watch that shit, then I would really appreciate you reporting back and letting me know how they did. Um, not how they did with regards to adapting the book, but just how, how it is as a show, just how it is on the face of it. Cause I'm at the point right now where I cannot look at it as just a show. You know what I mean? I can't like divorce the source material from it. I'm just, I'm just really fucking angry about that. But yeah, anyway, I'm done. All right. Y'all, y'all have a great weekend. Uh, I hope you have a good week and Thank you very much for listening. I love you all dearly. Peace out.